you are entering the realm of the Time Prophet, exploring the darker regions of time and the world about us. Time Prophet, you are the enemy of the Daleks. Leave this world or be destroyed. Welcome to Doctor Who and the Daleks, or rather some form of Doctor Who that you've never seen before. But this Doctor is not a Time Lord from Gallifrey, but just a human who has invented a time machine. Don't be shocked, even William Hartnell. The first Doctor wasn't a Time Lord when this was made. Time Lords were never written about until much later. It's a timey-wimey thing. So we start off in the first scene, where the Doctor, played by Peter Cushion, is reading a comic, and his granddaughter Susan is reading a book. This shows the relationship straight away and impresses that Susan is intelligent, but not as intelligent as the Doctor who invented a time machine in the shape of a 1950s police box. This is where the movie diversifies from Doctor Who TV series. In the series, the Doctor stole the TARDIS from the Time Lords and he is happy to potter around in time and space. But the makers of this movie didn't want to make the Doctor alien and grounded it in reality, with time travel of course. Even Barbara is intelligent reading a science book. We hear the chimes of the clock, a very poignant reminder of time, and the loud ticking in the background. Barbara reminds her grandfather that her boyfriend Ian is coming. Again, it diverses files from the TV series in the fact that they have to be a boyfriend and girlfriend, and not just fellow teachers at Cold Hill School. Ian turns up with a loud knock. Ian, of course, played by Roy Castle, was a well-known celebrity in his day. Barbara played by Jenny Linden, and Susan played by Roberta Tovey. Roy Castle was obviously the comedy relief in the movie. Peter Cushion cleverly wore a grey, wavy wig and a big moustache in case anybody would recognise him in the part. Peter Cushion was not particularly a fan of science fiction and played the part well but made damn sure his face was covered up. Both Barbara and Susan were strong, intelligent women. Don't ever let anyone tell you that there were no strong women before 2020. I am pretty sure that the comedy series Only Fools and Horses stole this comedy gag from Roy Castle falling through the door. The Doctor tells Ian to enter the TARDIS. He is shocked at the fact that it was bigger on the inside, but is probably more shocked at how bad the set looked. No, there were no shiny consoles and gleaming controls, but it looked like somebody had stapled some wires to some blackboards and left some chemistry equipment lying about. As with all science fiction in the 60s, everything had to make bleeping noises. The Doctor explains that if Ian should touch that lever, it would dissolve and enter into time and space. Barbara enters and gives Ian a hug, and they promptly fall over and knock Ian into the lever he wasn't supposed to touch. It seems, even in the 60s, strong, intelligent women fell for the wrong kind of man. And I mean, literally fell. If I didn't know better, I would have guessed that the Doctor primed the lever on purpose, knowing that it would accidentally get pushed. The TARDIS materialises into the ether. It doesn't make the usual pulsating wheezing of keys down piano wire, no. But sounds from the usual Lost in Space sound department that were recycled in every Hollywood movie of the time. The TARDIS seems to have a lot of objects resembling Dalek balls. A premonition of what's to come, maybe. Of course, Ian gets the blame for pressing the lever, even though it was Barbara who fell on him. The Doctor exclaims that it could be anywhere in the universe at any time. It was almost as if he had tricked Ian into coming before kidnapping him in time and space. They emerge from the TARDIS onto a strange alien world where the trees are made of polystyrene and had this strange echo, almost as if they were in some giant TV studio and not on an alien planet. The TARDIS lights flashes for no apparent reason and Ian thinks there must have been a forest fire because they looked as dead as Kevin Spacey's career. Ian wants to go home but Susan the Brave One wants to investigate. Susan picks an alien flower without knowing if it is safe or not, and the Doctor doesn't seem that worried at all. Barbara screams because in the 60s, no matter how intelligent you are, a papier-mâché monster will scare the willies out of you. Susan spots the city in the distance, but there doesn't seem to be any people about, 
so the Doctor decides to investigate. The strange thing is that Ian refers to the Doctor as Doctor Who. In the TV series, the Doctor is just known as the Doctor. The Who in the title is not his name, but a question. Only now Barbara decides it is dangerous. Papier mâché monsters are scary enough to scare any woman, even brave intelligent ones. Ian and Barbara want to go home and the Doctor is disappointed. I hope he doesn't make up an excuse to stop them leaving because that would be terrible. Susan goes to pick up a flower and gets a tap on the shoulder from a strange hand. She runs to Ian screaming and kicking because that is what intelligent young girls had to do in the 60s. They enter the TARDIS and suddenly there is a knocking sound from outside the door. The Doctor turns on the scanner to see who is outside. It's probably something they should have done when they first got there. There was nothing on the scanner. Although he didn't examine it for long, they go to take off as suddenly the TARDIS started making submarine noises. It is never good when the TARDIS makes submarine noises. The Doctor examines the controls and then discovers that one of the fluid links had leaked. Even though the TARDIS had landed without a problem, it was probably the softest landing in the world. Maybe this is the excuse the Doctor was looking for to stay, or maybe he was lying through his teeth. The Doctor states that they must try the city to find more mercury. Which is a strange coincidence because five minutes earlier he wanted to investigate the city. Me thinks this Doctor is a bit of a cad or extremely deceitful. They leave the TARDIS and Ian is drawn to a strange box on the floor. Barbara shouts in alarm because it could be dangerous but she is fine with Susan picking up all kinds of deadly alien flowers. Susan runs over and picks up the box because Ian was scared. Heck, can't be as dangerous as a flower can it? The Doctor finds some vials and tablets in the box and he concludes somebody must have left them. You can tell he is the shiniest tool in the box, can't you? They are soon at the city entrance, passing stretches of what looks like wooden plywood squares painted in gold paint. With architecture like this, you would be forgiven for thinking this wasn't a city of an intelligent life form, but a keen DIY race. The walls were lined with baker foil and somebody had forgotten to iron out the wrinkles. The musical score at this point was marvellous. It gave the right level of tension and dramatic poise, but then Ian spoils it with more of his comedy antics. The doors open automatically as they approach, making horrible clanging noises. This city would not be very stealthy. Ian gets locked outside because that is the job of the comedy relief. Barbara walks through corridors of corrugated plastic because the set designer got them cheap at the local DIY store and decided that the future is corrugated plastic. The door only seems to open for Ian when he sits down. The problem is, is this, Daleks can't sit down, so the Daleks would have a real big problem getting through this door. Barbara walks through a room full of Dalek eyes in the wall, and yet not one of these eyes sets off any alarm. Barbara walks into a room and the door is closed around her. Barbara screams, and due to the bad insulation in the city, the Doctor and Ian hear her scream outside. The Doctor, Ian and Susan run through a door in the direction of her screams. Unfortunately, this door doesn't let them get very far and leads them to a dead end. So they end up having to double back and go through the door that only opens when you sit down. The Doctor gets Susan to sit down and then she has to run through the door. The Doctor and Ian manage to hold the door open long enough for Susan to run through. In a million years, the Daleks may one day have the technology to learn how to sit down and then they can use that door too. They all walk past a random piece of technology in the hall. I don't know where they are, but whomever lives in this city is not very tidy at all. This walking around corridors happens for a considerable time in the movie. After a few regenerations, the Doctor will learn to run through a corridor. Susan holds her grandfather's hand, because at this time in cinematic history, filmmakers were not trying to destroy the family unit. The Doctor finds a measuring device which tells him that the planet has a very high level of radiation, and of course for some reason it is written in English. The Doctor then reveals that there is nothing wrong with the fluid link. The Doctor was a little liar. The control panel is on a giant revolving thing which looks cool but is totally impractical in an emergency. Then comes the great reveal. The camera pans out and we discover that the city is inhabited by the dreaded Daleks. The clue is in the name by the way. I think if they called the movie Doctor Who then maybe we would have been totally surprised to see the Daleks. But I think we were all expecting them to show up somehow. The Daleks were very colourful because the movie was filmed in Technicolor and they really made the most of it. These Daleks were better than the ones in the TV series because they had bigger lights and huge bumper stickers. Then the door dramatically opens and two more Daleks appear, the deadliest species in the known galaxy and they make sure these humans will not get in their way. Even so, Ian tries to run away and a Dalek non-lethally squirts him with his fire extinguisher. The Daleks in this movie were about as lethal as a boiling kettle. They even say Ian will recover shortly. Ian will recover shortly. 
These are not the Daleks I know from the TV series. There will be no recovering if one of these Daleks got hold of you. A Dalek searches the daughter and it is lucky that the fluid link is long enough, or there would have been no chance of that Dalek getting it out of his pocket. Barbara is alone and terrified. The hairspray in her hair is enough to nullify the effects of the radiation. Finally, the Daleks reunite Barbara with the rest of them. The Daleks want the drug that the files have, so they can leave their protective shells once more. I do not think that the Daleks had looked in a mirror for a while, because this would be impossible. The doctor says the people outside the city must have produced some form of anti-radiation drug. Little did they know, the Daleks were listening to every word. The Daleks tell the doctor that the files are horribly mutated, and yet again, they really need to look in a mirror. The Daleks tell Susan to get the drug, as they will die without it. I'm not entirely sure how a Dalek would use this drug, as I don't believe they have a mouth anyway. The Daleks lead Susan out of the city past stylish silver paper tastefully glued to the wall. I am not really sure of the purpose of this paper. I mean the Daleks are not well known for their art. I hope the Daleks don't get foiled again. The Daleks lead Susan out through the door that only opens when somebody sits down. I am not sure how they opened the door. Susan climbs down a pile of rocks, saving the knowledge that the Daleks couldn't follow. They don't learn to fly until the 1980s, so she was safe for a few years. The Daleks tell each other that the humans won't be getting the drug. They are only using them. The Daleks say, let them die, although in this movie, the Daleks are incapable of killing anyone with their nasty fire extinguishers. Susan goes in search of the fowls and the cure for the radiation. She is chased by a figure in a strange cloak. The cloak passes, and we see the fowls for the first time. Not only have they developed a cure for radiation in a dead forest with no tools, but they have also developed a particular craving to heavy eyeshadow and mascara. The file speaks with his distinct, upper-class English accent. My name is Elidon. I am a file. I tried to speak to you in the forest just now. He walks into the TARDIS and ignores the fact it was bigger on the inside and had wires glued to the wall. Elidon the file gives Susan the needed drugs and a second supply, knowing the Daleks would steal everything for themselves. Susan couldn't understand why the fowls were not mutated, and she obviously ignored the heavy eyeliner and the extended eyelashes. If they call us monsters, what must they be like? The Daleks saw through Susan's plan straight away, but let Susan give the drugs to her friends. Strange how the Daleks suddenly have the concept of friends. These are not the Daleks that I know, the ones who would exterminate at the drop of a hat. The Daleks say they don't need the formula now the girl has bought the drug, they can make it themselves. So the files have technology to make a drug to let them survive in the wilderness, but have no way of making food. The Daleks make a devastating plan. They will offer the files food and then exterminate them. However, if I was a fowl, I wouldn't want to eat any food the Daleks had prepared. I mean, the Daleks are not known for their culinary expertise. The Red Dalek said, They won't suspect an evil plan. And the other Dalek says, Not if it is written by their friend, the young girl. Now this is interesting. The files have never seen Susan's writing. How is that going to make them trust the message? Ignoring the fact that Susan wouldn't know the file language anyway. The Red Dalek takes Susan and tells the Doctor that they're going to help the files. The Doctor and Ian realise that the Daleks were listening to them all the time. All those Dalek eyes poking out of the wall was not a big enough clue for this Doctor. Susan writes a note for the files next to some rather lovely lava lamps. It just shows that the Daleks have good taste with the home decor. The Daleks make her write that they only want to help the files and be friends. If I was a file, I may be highly suspicious of a race that only wanted to rule and regularly practices genocide. Susan writes with a Dalek pen. It even has a Dalek ball on the top. Why would the Daleks have such a pen? I mean, when was the last time you ever saw a Dalek writing a note? Susan then steals the Dalek pen. Never let this girl inside a stationery shop. These files have the genius to make highly sophisticated radiation drugs, and yet they can't see through a duplicitous plan like this. Suddenly, the Daleks reveal their diabolical plan to Susan, that they will destroy the files when they come for food. What a race will do for some fish and chips. Susan uses the pen she stole to pull out the Dalek eye embedded in the wall, and the Daleks now decide that the prisoners are intelligent. The Daleks decide not to exterminate the main actors because the movie would end but they have no problem exterminating the files, with their fire retardant weapons. Susan, who is the master of the obvious, tells them that the Daleks are bringing the files into a trap. The Doctor says the Daleks have weapons that can paralyze or destroy. These are not the Daleks of old. The Daleks do not normally bother with the paralyzing stage. Susan says we are all doomed. 
And the fowls say, And if the Daleks have food, how can they refuse us? A fowl gives the letter to Aladon. Aladon says, The letter is from the young girl. How he knows this, I do not know, as he's never seen her writing before. The letter said that the Daleks would leave them food and make friends with them. These fowls must be the most gullible race in the cosmos. The gullible fowls decide to travel to the city of the Daleks in the morning, like the lemons they are. Also, what kind of food can they expect from the Daleks? I mean, your average Dalek will not be eating steak and chips. They probably have processed nutrients or porridge or something really inedible to humans. Or fowls for that matter. Aladon says, there's simply no reason that the Daleks don't want to make friends. Apart from more or less destroying the planet and leaving what is left a radioactive mess, the stupid is strong in this one. The Doctor discovers that the wall and the floors are made of metal, and Ian thinks they run around like dodging cars at the fair. <laughs> yes, the Daleks are basically dodging cars with balls, and they drive around on not any electricity that we know, but some form of static electricity, said the Doctor. Obviously, the Doctor has not come across balloons on planet Earth. The Doctor says if we can insulate the machines from their power source, then they would be useless. Susan offers her cape as a way to do the insulating, because the fowls, who have no technology, have a way to manufacture rubber capes. The Daleks bring food to the prisoners. Now, for some reason, the food looks like multicoloured porridge. Why would the Dalek chefs bother to make it multicoloured? It's only a nutrient to them. Anyway, Rob uses this nutrient to blind the Dalek while the others push him onto the insulated material which of course disables the Dalek, the most dangerous species in the galaxy, defeated by a cloak and no dagger. The Doctor and Ian remove the creature from inside the Dalek, and the Doctor tells Ian to pretend he is a Dalek, because for some reason there is plenty of room inside a Dalek, even though it was designed for some squiddy looking mutant. As they all leave the corridor, a squiddy looking hand pokes out with some rather alluring nails. The Dalek realises that the prisoners are trying to escape, but the Doctor disables the door. The problem is that he can't get Ian back out of the Dalek. The Daleks start to burn through the door and Ian can't get out. What will they do next? They can't push Ian into the lift because for some reason, Dalek lifts are a bit dodgy and it hasn't quite stopped in the right place. Masters of the Universe and the Daleks cannot build a working lift. Ian tells the others to leave him and they do without much argument. The Dalek burns through the door, and there is Ian. He fires and blows up Ian's Dalek, but what a surprise! Ian had managed to get out in the nick of time and fled into the lift. Now as I see it, there is a problem with the Dalek lift system. The first problem is that they only have one lift in the whole city. And the second problem is this. It takes about 30 or 40 seconds for the lift to go up. So if there was a battle, it would take the Daleks literally 10 minutes to get 10 Daleks out of the lift shaft as only one Dalek can enter the lift at a time. I propose a much better system that would get the Daleks out a lot quicker. My system could get a whole pile of Daleks out in a matter of seconds. The lemons, I mean fowls, head into the city. The doors all open inviting the flies into the spider's trap. The food is all piled up in brightly coloured boxes that look like the Daleks shop in Ikea or something. Again, the music is excellent and gives you the feeling of awe and terror but pity the multicoloured swap shop Daleks ruin the illusion. The files appear to be carrying yokes made out of wood. These yokes could not be made out of brittle wood, and so trees must be growing and must be strong. So if trees can grow, so could food producing plants. Also, on a similar subject, the files are wearing machine-made clothes. Remember the war happened centuries ago, so they're not wearing clothes from the past. They must have sewing machines or a method to manufacture their clothes, and yet they cannot produce food. The Doctor shouts a warning to the Fowls, and suddenly they believe him, even though they totally ignored his advice before. The first Fowl faces the Daleks, and they use their fire extinguishers on him, and kills him straight away. The only time in this movie where the fire extinguishers actually kill anything. The rest of the Fowls just run away, because the Daleks forgot to close the outer doors. Usually in a trap, closing the door behind the trapee is a requirement. So the Fowls run away, and the Daleks can't follow, because they can only travel on metal. Aladon couldn't understand why the Daleks wanted to kill them. You are different from them, and they are afraid of anything different. The Doctor explains that the Daleks hate them because they are different. I am not sure why the Doctor is explaining why the Daleks are bad to the Fowls. I mean, the Fowls should be telling the Doctor. The Doctor has only been here literally five minutes, but they have had to live with the Dalek tyranny all their life. Aladon says they are a peaceful people, and they see no reason to kill others. 
The Daleks have developed the drug they stole from the Fowls, and now finally they can leave their protective shells and wage war on the Fowls. Somehow I don't think the Daleks have looked in the mirror for a few centuries, because unbeknownst to them, their new form would not scare a sausage or a fowl, and would definitely not be in any condition for combat. The Doctor and the companions try to take off in the TARDIS, but the Doctor is so incompetent he forgot the Daleks had stolen the fluid link. He said we must get back. He said only the fowls can help us. Unfortunately, the fowls are so peaceful and laid back, it would be like asking the sausage to fight. The Doctor says that the fowls will die out unless they are prepared to fight for their lives. The fowls are so passive and naive that they think they can go through life without any aggression. The Doctor shows the fowl a lesson. He tells Ian to take the lady fowl to the Daleks for experimentation. And he even winks in front of Aladdin to Ian. And Aladdin was fooled so easily. These files were definitely built for Twitter. Aladdin shouts, You cannot do this! I am glad all the years Barry Ingham spent at Rada didn't go to waste. He gets up and punches Ian. He has gone from a passive file to an angry file literally in 30 seconds. The Doctor says one sentence and ruins a thousand years of passive aggression. The Daleks tested the drug on a batch of Daleks who went a little crazy and they were very unhappy that the drug would do them no good. Suddenly, out of the blue, they have a neutron bomb. Who would have thought it? So they had this neutron bomb the whole time, and they decided to give food to the files instead of just blowing them up. Something wrong with their logical thinking, in my view. This movie at times can lead to confusion. So the Doctor changes a whole base of passive beings into a fighting force because he lost the fluid link to the TARDIS, and they can't get home without it. He sounded less like Peter Cushion and more like William Hartnell every minute. So the files decide to attack the Daleks, with what I do not know. A race that can fashion rubber cloaks and radiation sickness pills can't even fashion a pointy stick. Not that pointy sticks would have any effect on a Dalek. Aladdin volunteers that Ian goes through the deadly swamp, because he probably doesn't like him. We cut to the scene, showing the lovely Dalek lava lumps, and the chief Dalek asks for a report. The Daleks know the files are coming, but they think they will die, and in all likelihood they probably should have done. Ian and Barbara and some scared files get to the edge of the swamp. One terrified foul shouts, We'll never get through! I will give you one guess as to which foul doesn't make it through the swamp of the mutants. Barbara wants to rest because even though she is intelligent, she had very weak legs. Ian, who is not intelligent, decides he could do with a wash in a deadly swamp full of mutants. But luckily they find pipes instead of mutants and decide that this is the way into the city. The foul who was scared earlier has now found a new bravery and decides to fill up their water bottles. We never did find out what happened to that poor foul but I can guarantee there is a mutant somewhere licking his lips. Poor Elian was no more. The Doctor says we must find a way of approaching the Daleks without being detected. Maybe he should have had this conversation before sending Ian and Barbara to their doom. Ian, Barbara and the two fowls bravely climb the painted mountain on a world not unlike the planet of the Time Prophet. The climb was much harder because somebody had cut steps into the mountain. The Dalek leader proclaims the neutron bomb will put even more radiation into the planet and even the fowls won't survive and they will win the war that their ancestors started. I think the Daleks may have a nasty shock coming. The Daleks state that the neutron bomb would explode in one hour. Since when have the Daleks used Earth time measurements? Shouldn't they be using rails? One of the files gets scared again, so the other files punch him in the face. They sure learnt this violence thing very quickly. It only took one doctor to do it. The doctor catches the female file looking at herself in the mirror, because even files are quite vain on Skara. The Doctor decides that the mirror will get them into the city, quite unconcerned that Ian and Barbara may have already been eaten by mutants. So all the fowls confuse the Dalek instruments by waving mirrors about. Anyone would think that this master race is slightly lacking in what it means to be a master race. The Daleks have a nasty surprise waiting for the fowls. Well, the nasty surprise was three Daleks saying, Do not move, you are our prisoners. I am not really sure how the Daleks were going to enforce this, as they could only go as far as the edge of the rocks. The Doctor and Susan get captured by the Daleks, and they say they will be the rulers here. They will explode the neutron bomb. One problem here, you can't rule if you have destroyed the people you are ruling. The countdown begins from a hundred rails. I'm not quite certain why they didn't just press the button, marked fire, but nevertheless, the Daleks had to create tension by using the countdown device. The Doctor tries to convince the Daleks to stop the countdown after he tells them of his space-time machine, but to no avail. I am only guessing they are using rails now, but it could be seconds, as earlier in the movie they said the bomb would go off in an hour. Who am I to say? Meanwhile, Ian and Barbara's team have to cross a dangerous ravine by jumping to the other side. A foul falls while they cross, but it's okay, barely a scratch. This movie doesn't like killing too many fouls. Turns out after he cuts the rope to save Ian, I falsely assume he's going to fall to his death. 
but as it turns out, he is okay. What a relief. Ian, Barbara and the Files manage to get into the city and get chased by the Daleks and their ineffective fire extinguishers. The Daleks say, you cannot get away, but they have proven time and time and again it isn't that hard to evade the Dalek. They get into the lift and the Dalek kindly asks them to come back down. I'm pretty sure Spike Milligan wrote the script. Ian and Barbara evade more Daleks who can only catch people who stand still and are not running. Somehow more files have got into the city and attacked the Daleks with a rope. The countdown takes an inordinate amount of time to actually count down and finally it hits the 24 rel mark. The files easily overwhelm the Daleks on their puny fire extinguishers that seemingly can only destroy other Daleks. The files have no weapons but can avoid the metal kettles quite easily and push them all over the place. The Daleks go to exterminate Ian and end up blowing up the device that would fire a neutron bomb. These Daleks should really rethink their weaponry. The Daleks also destroyed their power supply and all died. The Doctor and companions say their goodbyes to the Fowls and Ian has one more comedy escapade as the TARDIS materialises in front of a Roman army marching towards them. We never do find out if they got away. Well, in this movie anyway. Okay, I will start by saying what I hate about the movie. Well, I've always had a love-hate thing for this film. On the one hand, I love Doctor Who and I love the actor Peter Cushion. But on the other hand, it is obvious the movie was aimed at the younger end of the, end of the market. It doesn't take too much to pull the movie apart plot-wise. I don't like the Dalek dialogue. Some of the things they say does not seem very Dalek-like. I don't like the fact that the Daleks use fire extinguishers for guns and the fact that they cannot aim for toffee. I don't really like the relationship between Ian and Barbara. I prefer it when they were just acquaintances, like in the series. I can forgive the Doctor being human rather than a Time Lord, as the movie writers only had a couple of Hartnell episodes to work from, and Time Lords were not even mentioned until the Troughton era. On to what I love about the movie. I love the fact that this and the following film is the only movie that features the Daleks. I love Peter Cushion. I don't think Peter had a love for Cypher, but he played the part well. Roy Castle, who wasn't really an actor but a comedian, did well in the role. It was obvious he was only put in the movie as comedy relief anyway, and would later be replaced by Bernard Cribbins in the sequel movie. It is hard to say what I like about the movie, because I have watched it hundreds of times and I can see all the flaws, but I keep coming back. The movie does have a kind of magic about it, and I know I will watch it again and again, which is more than I could say for some current era movies, and even current Doctor Who. I will give this movie 6 out of 10 on the old time profit meter. It is well worth watching, but don't expect perfection. It is time for the Time Prophet to leave this universe. Please subscribe and I will bid you farewell.